Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the Economic Times. My name is Ashutosh Sena and today we will be talking with a focus on the pharmaceutical sector. Given the changes that are being seen in the sector in the last few years, and it could continue and the change could happen over the next decade or so, of course, further as well. It is something that everyone should be looking forward to, this conversation in particular. The conversation today has been part of a series of what we are talking about, the changing workflows, the workplace and the workforce. The Economic Times and UKG presents changing workfor workforce management dynamics in the pharmaceuticals industry. And as always, I have my colleague Nasreen Sultana joining me to lend her helping hand. Good afternoon, Nasreen. Good afternoon, Ashu. Uh, it is so important that we talk about the pharmaceuticals industry because it had the lifeline for the world throughout the pandemic. Post-pandemic world, the industry needs a rethink. And one of the big ways in which the change will come through is through its people. Manufacturing operations have undergone a radical change during this period, and the pharmaceutical sector cannot remain untouched. The pandemic has made the workforce more mobile, of course, and adding that extra layer of complexity to the operations. Exactly, Nasreen. Uh, the broader issue that is unique to the industry also needs attention. At the peak of the pandemic, it was about managing with whatever workforce was available. That was a key requirement to make your operations efficient. Now, one of the key issues for the pharmaceutical companies is about smartly managing and optimizing the resources they have at the plant. The workplace today is often hybrid, adding to the challenges for the plant manager. In addition, he must also manage some remote workers while managing their different skills and employment type. That's some complexity that must be addressed, Nasreen. And you know what, Ashu, that could be just scratching the surface. The industry is actually a people-oriented one, which requires more product accuracy with minimum compliance risk, more visibility on operations. The global standards need to be maintained always and more skilled on a workforce is needed to cater to the variability in production demand. The pandemic, uh, which caused an uncertain workforce supply and the need for improved productivity, forced workers to raise output, sometimes more work with less resource. Adding to the challenges, of course, Ashu, is the regulatory compliance for the domestic and overseas markets. And that gives you an overview of the challenges the pharmaceutical industry actually had faced during the COVID time. And of course, in the way in the coming years ahead, probably these are the few challenges the companies need to address, Ashu. Yeah, exactly, Nasreen. So as we welcome and introduce the experts who will be joining us for the conversation, just a reminder, please do post your questions in the Q&A tab that you have, and we'll try and get some of the best ones, some of the good ones to be addressed by the experts. Not often do you get an opportunity to address your questions to the experts from the industry that we are joined by today. So let me introduce uh, the gentlemen and all the experts we have today. Mr. Amitava Saha, he's CHRO at Biocon. Mr. Atul Suri, VP and SPU head at Alembic Pharmaceuticals. We also have Mr. Farhat Umar, present global human resources, mankind pharma. That's right. And we also joined by Mr. Ankush Pawar. He is Associate Director HR at MCure. Mr. Anupam Bhatt, head of human relation Injectables, uh, India Myelin Labs at Beatrice. And of course, we have Sumit Doshi. He is a senior director and country manager, India UKG. So welcome gentlemen to the panel and we hope to have a very engaging 90 minutes as we go along and talk to each one of you. So first, uh, if I can request Sumit for a short welcome note for everyone. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Nasreen. And thank you, Ashutosh, uh, for, uh, for having me here and uh, uh, inviting me to this platform. Uh, 
I, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, invite our uh, illustrious CHROs uh, from, uh, from, 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 from some of the best known organizations in the pharma industry. Thank you, each one of you, uh, for joining us here. Uh, UKG, uh, for, for some of you on the, on the audience, who you probably know us as Kronos. Uh, UKG has been uh, uh, an organization that has focused on delivering solutions for its customers uh, to, to help better manage their workforce, uh, drive better productivity and visibility over the, over the years for a global organization. And uh, with Economic Times, our objective was to, uh, to try and hear uh, from industry experts like you on what's ailing uh, the pharma industry when it comes to managing your workforce and what what can be done to uh, to to actually drive uh, uh, better uh, productivity, drive better capabilities, and make, become more competitive. So so this is a series that uh, we've uh, we've been working with Economic Times to see uh, uh, and learn from from experts like you, and 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 hence be able to provide better solutions to you, uh, to our customers as we go along. So 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 that's that's my selfish interest of being part of this uh, uh, this, this event. Uh, but uh, but really thank you each one of you for being part of this and I really look forward to this conversation and learning a lot from from your experience. Thank you for being on the panel. Thanks, Sumit. Uh, now that we have warmed up to the broad talking points, let's start with a conversation and something that we've all been looking forward to. We have uh, quite a bit of attendees also joining us online. So my first question is to Mr. Amitabha Saha. The landscape for manufacturing industries and engaging with the workers have definitely changed dramatically over the last two years, and there's no denial of that. But as you have geared up for the new normal, and, and it's been uh, almost a year that we have seen a world post-pandemic and post-lockdown, how has the normal work schedule? How have, you, how have things changed, and how are you planning and executing production activities now? That's a, that's a pretty long question, Nasreen, so I'll try and address as shortly as possible or in short as possible. Uh, so the first one is the change has been gradual. It is not that the change has happened overnight. Mm -hmm. So the, the first set of changes happened during uh, the first bout of pandemic, followed by a break, then a second bout and so on and so forth. So the way I look at uh, the workforce in pharmaceuticals, uh, there are two sets of people. One set who are in manufacturing operations, and they have to be on the shop floor, irrespective of what happens outside. And the other lot, which are partly and uh, you know in some roles completely in enabling functions, and they have gone through a lot of change in their work schedules and the way uh, life has been during and after the pandemic. So the second lot, we have spoken a lot. I mean, in various forums, we have talked about flexibility in work, uh, you know, logging in from anywhere, anytime. And the focus since the pandemic has always been the, the objective part of the deliverables. Uh, what needs to be delivered, when it has to be delivered, the quality of the deliverables and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The first group had always been required at the, at the site where the manufacturing operations are done. And for them, we have gone through a lot of change in terms of how we manage the workforce. The first part was how to enable them to come to office. So during pandemic, most of the pharmaceutical companies, since they had a license to operate, had a lot of passes and a lot of transportation facilities, uh, which enabled employees to come in. Shifts were reorganized to make sure that we could optimally use the manpower we had within the premises. And of course, you know, if you are redoing shifts and you relook at holidays, we look at work hours, we look at you know various stretchable targets like overtime and so on, right? So that you know, it's like an event, like a World War II. I mean, the event changes lives forever. So I think pandemic has changed our lives forever. So even if uh, the situation is okay or is gone back to uh, normal now, uh, the changes uh, to a certain extent have prevailed. So I'll, I'll stop here uh, and I'll, uh, you know, give my other colleagues a chance to talk about things, but uh, we can revisit this topic saying how we have actually enabled the workforce at the operations facility to work better. Sure, that's that's an interesting uh, idea because that's where the challenges happen. So let me ask Atul then. Atul, companies are talking about production plan and trying to sync it with the preferences that employees are asking. 
you know, yeah. that's getting into the operational details. So how is the regular work schedule adjusting to the emerging situation? What are the challenges, if any, you're facing? Yeah, so, uh, but Ashutosh, I mean, could I just in continuation, just give a few comments uh, please, on what please, Amitava please. had said. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, even in your opening address, and the one word that kept coming up very frequently is the word change. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, that's something change. Your entire topic is changing of the workforce, changing of the workplace and stuff like that. Uh, quite clearly, we learned some solid lessons uh, during the pandemic, undoubtedly. For organizations that changed after the change, it was doom. For those who changed with the change, uh, they well survived. But those who could change much before the change actually thrived. And mm -hmm. therefore, I want to introduce this little concept of organizations being adaptable, radically adaptable. And I'll just take 30 seconds on that because that's important. It's The pandemic is done and dusted. We've, uh, you know, we've come out of it. We've all survived uh, reasonably well. But I think as senior HR people, we need to be far more adaptable. The organization has to be adaptable. And that's an art. And art is not just in the word art, but it's an, actually an acronym that I've created. It's about anticipating the change. As HR leaders, we need to anticipate the change. We have to reinterpret it and you know, do our various scenario buildings uh, based on that and then transform the change. And this obviously uh, follows what I call the 4P approach. The first three Ps everybody really does, uh, the senior management does in cross-functional teams of it being predictive, of it being proactive, of it being progressive. But where HR really steps in is it has to be permeable. The change has to go through the length and breadth of the company of all employees. And that's where we have to step in. Uh, and so therefore, when we look at uh, changing workforce, we should have in mind what are the situations and scenarios that can possibly come up. It could be an earthquake. I, I know of certain huge B2B manufacturing facilities in the farm industry who have 15 plants uh, in one location. And, it, it, you know, it could be earthquake prone. What are your plans there? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be that much more forward looking. So that's one perspective that I just wanted to bring into the discussion as senior HR leaders. If you're not having these conversations uh, in our own organizations, we need to think about it. We need to war game, like you say in the army, you war game a situation. you got to war game these situations and come up with your responses so that if something occurs, you can beat the change and you can really thrive. Uh, so I just wanted to add that to what Amitava really said. Uh, we need to see what more we can do by predicting the change. Uh, 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 if you could just paraphrase your question again, just the so, key aspects. So what are some of the challenges that you're facing in the regular work schedule as it is unfolding? So uh, 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 with the manufacturing uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, premise, really, um, I don't have too much of experience, but what I can tell you is where you have planned schedules, uh, there's not so much of a thing where, you know, uh, M0, you have to do this, M plus one, you got to do this, M plus two, this is what your production is all about. Uh, we have adequate softwares and systems in place uh, that get the workforce optimally utilized. Uh, so that's not a problem. But if there's something unplanned that steps in, you obviously can't rely that much on software, so I'm sure Sumit will have a view on that and he can uh, tell us more on that later. But unplanned sort of things, yes, it is a challenge and then you have to you know, crank in uh, in the most effective and efficient manner. Uh, in so far as scheduling, I thought your question was around scheduling of the manpower. Scheduling was just one part of it anyway, but, of it. Yeah. We'll, but we'll try and move on. Uh, Nasreen, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to bring Farhad to the conversation. And uh, in the post-pandemic world, because that's that's the new normal right now, the conversation has definitely moved from productivity to our output versus engagement with the workers. All companies are really trying to, as uh, you know, we had uh, the panelists talking about adaptability. Of course, the, we, uh, the companies are trying to engage with the workers. So Farad, uh, can you share some details about that change and how is that being monitored and evaluated? First of all, thank you so much for including me in this discussion, Ashu and Nasreen and all. Definitely, there are many, many factors are present today in today's pharma market, which are driving change in uh, workforce management uh, from socioeconomic dynamics to regulatory policy, government uh, policies also. Digital disruption is main uh, factor. Portfolio mix is also many, many companies, therapeutic areas is also changing from acute to chronic, okay, because mm -hmm. uh, the growth per capita income is increasing. The millennials are coming and uh, giving tough time to pharma companies to scheduling their 
uh, whatever is there, the, the manufacturing units or sales and marketing, whatever. Total, I, I could see the total transformation is happening all, all the pharma companies. Many, many companies now, they're having a digital team also. Now we, many companies, they have a CDO also and guys are from uh, big four, they are joining pharma companies also. So there's a big challenge uh, we are facing uh, because, uh, you know, normal uh, pharma employees and the guys from coming from IT industries, they have a different culture, different values and uh, taking them into one team is, is always a big, a big uh, problem, you know. So, and the second thing that if you see that, that the team, that the team is not like that uh, providing the pill to the patient or it is more than becoming a health care of solutions partners to doctors and patients and how you can align them quickly because speed is required after this pandemic it is not only that whether we have a good uh, automation good technology and one more thing which which came out after second uh, wave which was which was more lethal actually that focusing more more on our employees actually this is this is very very important how to protect our employees and customers are, are there. Uh, we have to focus on the customer as well as our employee also because the second thing, our our gap uh, between uh, training and the execution of medical reps in the market is also chain or medical reps have become a complete uh, tool, electronic tool. I would say that they are providing better information to medical fraternity and they are spending more time and it is not like that you just give training and ask them to go mm -hmm. and meet the doctors uh, detailing is not required now actually there's more than that the technology is coming into the patient and doctors and in between the medical reps is working as a kind of robotic kind of uh, duties they are they are more knowledgeable they have more uh, flexibility also the challenge mm -hmm. is only that the more more than the uh, the population is now millennials also, and after 2017, I think more than 65% people will be of uh, age of 35 and all. That is a big challenge for the pharma companies to retain the talent. So, sure, I have sure. some more points, but I will add later on. Okay. Sure, 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 sure. So, Anupam, then, you know, Atul did refer to some of the challenges of getting back to work and settling in the new routine, if I may say, you know, with. So, what are some of those? So if you'd like to mention some of these operational challenges in managing the workforce in the current environment. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, first of all, having me in this conversation. And I think uh, I'll try my best to, you know, add, add value to uh, all these points which are being discussed. Uh, Ashu, I think uh, this uh, pandemic has exposed us to disruption in business concept in a, in a probably totally different manner. I mean, organizations had practiced VUCA, you know, as a concept, trying to have risk mitigation plans. Uh, people, people had their emergency action plans. Companies looked at very nicely drafted documents on response plans, but probably one incident of pandemic of COVID-19 virus and everything was mm -hmm. off care. And one of the things probably we, we had to face, and I, I'm just trying to bring in a very common sense uh, element, and that is of fear. The first uh, emotion which came in the mind of people was fear. And whether it was because of lockdown gadanda or whether it was getting infected by stepping out of home, or whether it was, you know, uh, all the media and WhatsApp and, you know, hype about uh, this disease, but employees were not willing to step out of their home. And it was, it was more out of social pressures. It was more out of a situation where uh, apartment society would shut door for someone who is stepping out and going to work. And probably first wave saw uh, a situation where organizations managed uh, to come out of that fear. Now here we are 20 months, 25, 24 months down the line. And I think what has happened during this time is that uh, employees have, you know, undergone uh, various kinds of experiences and whether it's a hybrid model or a physical model or you know combination of uh, working 
half of the week from workspace and half of the week from uh, remote working model. I think one thing which all of us have to look forward to is how, how we uh, describe our workplace practices and create policies around that. Uh, I'll take one more minute on just you know, sharing the complexities of this industry when it comes to an integrated business model where you have producers in form of you know, operators, chemists, you know, shop floor guys, the typical shop floor guys, they are the producers. To produce, they have to be in front of machine. They have to be in front of equipment that cannot go to their home. So that's, that's one section which has to come to workplace. And then there are, you know, enabling functions, support functions, where probably uh, a digital uh, platform or a channel can help them uh, get things done. But they need to interact with these producers to, you know, uh, get, get their tasks completed. And then there is a front end business where probably the interaction is more with the outside world, the revenue generating stream. And there the work practices uh, need to be probably relooked, recasted, and probably uh, organizations need to uh, develop their own methods to address those kind of issues. So one of the challenges which probably the HR fraternity will face is how to blend uh, a combination of work from office to work from home or remote working kind of model. In most of the cases, probably it will be a combination of business head and HR who need to look at role requirements and then devise and design processes to deal with these kind of challenges. Right. I want to bring uh, Ankush to the conversation now and uh, something that we have, been, uh, we have started talking about engagement with workers. Uh, so Ankush, how are smarter companies looking to enhance engagement with uh, their workers? And uh, according to you, what are the benefits do you see acquiring from the enhanced uh, engagement activities? And uh, what do you think, how can the smarter companies can actually manage their workforce through this period of transition? Yeah, uh, thank you, Nasreen, uh, to have me here. Uh, very pertinent question. And uh, as my colleagues have uh, told about uh, challenges and uh, about COVID also, COVID situation. So basically what has happened over a period of time is that any challenge, if you take it as an opportunity as well, uh, as we are saying, as Anum, Anupam just said, that uh, COVID has uh, really changed the dynamics. And if you see the trend of last three years, uh, when it hit the first time, first year, uh, 2020. So uh, most of, if you see the attrition level, the employees movement, if you see, it was quite low because people were fearing about their jobs. And this is across uh, across the sector in pharma, whether it is manufacturing, whether it is R&D, whether it is the field force, sales force. But if you see it 2021 onwards, suddenly there was a rush uh, in the attrition uh, there were a lot of opportunities available and especially so in uh, talent sector, uh, IT sector. Uh, we, we have seen a lot of uh, upheaval in that because even IT also opened up suddenly and then a uh, lot of IT employees engaged in pharma sector or life sciences sector started moving out because their expectation increased suddenly. So very right question that how you engage uh, the workforce. And as I was, as I was saying, uh, this is uh, the very fact that we are uh, talking on Zoom right now. Uh, a lot of uh, my colleagues also will agree that pandemic has uh, forced us to adopt this new technology. And this is same applicable for the employees. What uh, we have done, uh, how it can be done is uh, that a uh, lot of uh, IT interventions, like we have used all these IT platforms to engage employees, including uh, in fact, our uh, regulatory trainings, uh, we have done it on IT platforms. Uh, the technology is more available uh, for uh, quick fix solutions like uh, having, as you said, uh, the regulatory part also uh, we, uh, in the industry, we have come across a lot of modules on the regulatory part, which 
the limit of classroom training or classroom uh, exercises was uh, uh, removed and then virtual space was used for uh, leverage for uh, uh, giving the trainings to employees. This is one part of the engagement. Right. Another part is uh, when people are back at workplace, whether it is at the field or uh, at the factories or at the R&D centers. Uh, uh, with that fear in mind, we really had to remove uh, the pandemic fear as well as at the same time, you had to maintain uh, the uh, uh, hygienic practices at the uh, floor and at the field. So uh, balancing that was really a tough job. Uh, let me tell you. But over a period of time, uh, uh, engaging with the people, uh, having the right educational practices to them, uh, once they come into the premises, you have a lot of SOPs for them. So that has really helped to uh, alleviate all these fears of the employees. So, yeah, uh, uh, I'll start. Farhat wanted, to make a, yeah, Farhat wanted to make a point quick. So other than the normal employee engagement, actually, the one important factor which has been seen in pharma sectors that the companies are focusing more on wellness now because the business continuity is increased and the speed is required. And many, many companies, I got it, numbers also that the recruitment is not stopped actually because of the pandemic. The more number of manpowers are coming. So, wellness is one factor uh, which is also coming in a big way, and that's why the employees are focusing more on their wellness and the companies also focusing because the cost of insurance insurance premium, the claims are very high actually. And the one more thing, if you have wellness program which are well established in the organization, not only the people will be engaged, but the cost will be saved and it will improve the attendance also and the productivity, which is very, very important in our manufacturing units. So I think after this pandemic, I think we have a new areas, new venues for the employee engagement and wellness is playing a very important role. I just wanted to add this point. Sure, sure. Yeah, so, so uh, may I also, uh, in sure, continuation sure. to what Farhat was saying, uh, wellness, yes, but uh, there's another very interesting trend happening in uh, pharma manufacturing. And that is, uh, there is the, the gap that you had or the walls that you had between a blue collar and a white collar that's blurring as you go ahead. And the point I'm making here is of what he talks about wellness. Today, you don't differentiate between a blue collar and a white collar. Uh, medical facilities, medical uh, insurance is made available to these workers. Now, why is it happening? Uh, that also needs to be seen. Uh, the contract uh, workforce is a very significant part of manufacturing. And uh, today, uh, there is an opportunity after the pandemic with China being not so preferred, and where the quality was not so great, but the prices were great. But over here in India, we are now going to be focusing more on quality, giving quality products out to the world. And therefore, you need to focus on the blue collar as much as the white collar. And this is uh, something that's uh, really taking shape. There are a lot of incidents, maybe uh, in the course of this very discussion, I'll bring them up. I don't want to sure, uh, sure. you know, upset your schedule, really. No, 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 it's not about that. Yeah. It's about the points that you're making. But uh, yeah. Sumit, as the industry, as the industry wide, you want to raise the bar. You want to get into the more value added segments. You want to get better quality workers, raise the operational efficiencies. What are some of those things that the industry should keep in mind? Sure. And uh, thanks, Sashtosh, uh, once again for having me here. But uh, I think there are some amazing uh, points uh, to hear from the panelists. And I, uh, so, so I, I come from a, uh, I don't come from the pharma industry, as, as you all know, I come from a technology uh, background where we do a lot of work with pharma companies. And I'll try and bring a little bit of that perspective in. So, uh, so, so uh, I think there is uh, some of the points that were mentioned by, uh, by, by, by Atul and uh, uh, by Farhat, for example, the, the recent point that was on wellness around blue collar and uh, the, the, the diminishing gap between a blue collar and white collar uh, employee or even a contract employee. So what's increasingly happening is uh, across organizations, across companies, this need to drive greater engagement and greater experience for your blue collar and contract employee is, is significantly higher, right? And uh, but the but the mechanisms that you can possibly use to drive engagement or drive their experience is a little different from say the enabling workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very easy for the enabling workforce to say, okay, you can work from home, uh, be flexible about your work. You have to take your kid to school. Don't come in tomorrow. Stuff like that. 
you could not really do that for uh, for a for a blue collar or contract employee now which is where uh, some of the directions that i've seen companies are going into is uh, what uh, if if you, if a blue collar employee has to work 5 days a week or 6 days a week in shifts uh, what are the ways in which i can make it more flexible for him what are the ways in which i can make it a little more uh, uh, how should i put it what are the ways in which i can empower him a little more in terms of what works for him versus what is being imposed to me by my organization right so 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 this an area that i've seen some organizations trying to get into is bringing in a little more flexibility on the work schedules of uh, blue collar uh, employees even to some extent even contract employees not, not it's not happening so much but it's possible where and now how do you drive that flexibility you 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 can't tell them that you work for two days at home so the flexibility is all about being able to identify if an employee x cannot come in a morning shift can he or ca can there be an a mechanism for an employee x to swap it with an employee y right with the right skill and availability now this tends to throw up and this will i think i'll try and answer what atul mentioned right in the beginning this tends to throw up a lot of complexity in deployment of people the traditional mechanism of deployment has been that you have a certain set of people and you deploy them across what you might call as abc shifts and rotate them because you do, because the if you in, if increase more complexity in that it's a, it's a very difficult mathematical problem to solve that this is where digital tools start coming in so with the increase in digitization with the increase in ability to digitize and do these complex calculations that if sumit doshi as a as a blue collar employee is not available tomorrow who is the best fit available for me to pick from somewhere else etc etc if i can bring in the tools that brings that together i i will be able to provide far more flexibility to my employees to take care of it in fact there are companies that are even toying with the idea of and and it's i i know it's not going to happen easily but there are even companies that are toying with the idea of saying okay these are my shifts for the next one week or 10 days or 15 days i post it online and then it is the employees who can come and pick it up basis uh, the best uh, fit and skill availability so so the so scheduling is an example where which brings in a lot of variables there are the business variables which is the production plan the changing production plans the sku changing so there is the there is the business drivers that come in to change your schedules and then there are these huge number of employee variables which is his availability his preference even even uh, uh, compliance that's the biggest thing i have to bring all of these variables together and yet provide the flexibility not an easy job by any stretch of imagination this is where uh, uh, but but in order to provide more flexibility to that employee on the ground you've got to start playing with some of these areas and 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 this is where in my mind as i come from the digit uh, uh, technology side i think technology plays a very critical role because the optimization tools required to do this are not not uh, not easily done manually on excel uh, mm -hmm. so that's an area that i wanted to talk about lot many more thoughts but we will hold it for uh, further discussion sure uh, just 30 minutes of the conversation and we are buzzing with a lot of questions i think as we go along uh, ashu and i will uh, take all those questions there are like really lot of questions just 30 minutes uh, uh i want to uh, you know come to amitava or uh, anupam uh, you know for many companies uh, this is also a time uh, of resetting lot of uh, you know previous policies and here i'm talking about about, uh, about diversity and inclusion in the widest sense of the word how does the right approach uh, to that positively impact the availability of the talent for the for the companies Anupam Anupam, yeah. okay, I'll, I'll I'll take it. Yes. So, uh, Nasreen, uh, very good point. I think uh, DEI, as we uh, call diversity, equity, and inclusivity right now, I think uh, that is now getting uh, under the umbrella of ESG, and ESG is something that all companies are working on, uh, both uh, pharma sectors and others. I think uh, DEI and uh, you know part of esg esg is comparatively much newer in india uh, this started uh, even before the pandemic the, the diversity part at least the gender diversity part was much before the pandemic so uh, yes there are changes in policies but i'll just take a a minute to say that this is not just limited to dei or esg we are looking at policies in terms of work hours in terms of different kinds of leaves in terms of training in terms of how you are uh, optimizing the workforce when you have my colleagues talked about digital interventions so you are looking at 
workforce management tools. You are looking at policies which revolve around those tools to ensure how you will be doing your hours at work and how you would be giving your attendance and how it would, you know, in a way adhere to schedules. Uh, we are also enabling all plants even before we had automated plants, but now it is almost essential to have DCS, MES, LIBS, and all of that in most of the operating plants because even audits are becoming virtual. So I think people have got very used to this new set of policies, which are in essence giving them more choices, more leverage, more flexibility. Uh, coming to the talent pool, yes, uh, you know, at least for the pharma sector, what uh, I have seen is there's uh, a dearth of uh, gender diversity talent at the top. Now, what happens is, uh, you know, usually when we look at people progressing in their career, we look at relevant experience. Now, unless you have built a huge bottom of the pyramid, over a period of time, your the funnel gets narrower and narrower at the top. And so you get even lesser, uh, you know, in terms of gender equality or gender profiles. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, even with that, uh, what most of the industry players are doing are being innovative. They are bringing in other forms of talent into the company where, you know, let's say if I'm looking at supply chain, I don't necessarily have to look at somebody who's done pharma supply chain. I could look at a completely different industry to bring in. In operations, there could be people coming in chemical industries, other forms of manufacturing industries, even people who do not have exact manufacturing experience. Yeah. So yes, it's a, it's a tough job getting leaders at the top unless you're growing them from within. But at the middle and bottom of the pyramid for the last few years, there's been a tremendous thrust in terms of building uh, diversity and now DEI and ESG. Over to you, Anupam. I think, uh, Amit, you have very nicely put across the entire industry perspective. Uh, Nasreen, I, I will just be very curt on a couple of aspects which are basically a big challenge uh, for for not only pharma industry, but other industries also. Uh, so if I look at uh, this topic, and if I have to talk about diversity and inclusion uh, in organization, uh, typically in the setup which I come from, it has a global structure and a regional structure. Okay, So at an organizational level, at global level, uh, there, are, there are a lot of things happening. There are task force created, there are resource groups created, and uh, we are a part of that. And at macro level, at top level, there are a lot of policy decisions which are getting now influenced by the inputs and you know uh, feedback which is coming from that group. But if I look at what has, what has changed in last couple of years, especially for pharma industry and supply chain in particular, which is, which is where the maximum workforce today uh, you know, is, is enrolled. Uh, till some time back, uh, the, the idea around gender diversity was that, look, there are certain aspects of Factories Act where, you know, lady employees are not allowed to work beyond a particular time, or there are statutory provisions which are restrictive. And because of that, we won't be able to look at a better gender ratio. I think all those things are going away. Uh, most of the statutory reforms which are coming up have enabled uh, you know, elimination of all those uh, barriers. Mm -hmm. It's now a mindset issue. It is now something which, is, which has to be driven as a commitment towards you know, a, a, a policy approach. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the organizations have realized that uh, you know, all those traditional and legacy work practices, which were governed by rules, uh, you know, time office uh, rules and time and uh, uh, time based uh, uh, monitoring and all those things are probably, uh, they, 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 are, they, are, they are outdated now. If somebody is still into those kind of policies, probably uh, they are not contemporary in their approach. While, you know, for, from discipline point of view, there will be a monitoring, but there's a lot of flexibility coming around, you know, those aspects. Sure. Uh, so the 
the subject of diversity today in India is only probably focusing on gender diversity, but I think there are, there's a lot to be done. Differently abled group is something we should look at. Mm -hmm. uh, our TA policies need to be more contemporary and more probably in line with modern world practices. Uh, I think we'll have to go back to roles and look at role requirements with a different lens and probably uh, you know, redefine the ability aspect of, of, of the role requirement. Uh, that's, that's one area where probably the HR fraternity needs to work. Sure. So let, so let me, since we spoke of gender diversity, let me try and broaden that concept or the idea of diversity as we speak about it and also include the other part of the workforce, which could, as we just briefly spoke about it earlier, which is the uh, blue collar and white collar, but from the pharma industry, from executives, field force, contractual, temporary, to researchers in the labs, the mix is really wide. How can tech help in making it across or taking the message across all of these workers? Uh, you know, Atul, would you like to add? And maybe later I can ask uh, Farhat also to re respond to that. See, uh, so yes, you're right. Uh, these are challenges uh, that uh, large uh, companies uh, like all of us face. Uh, various departments, uh, various locations, various geographies in terms of local, uh, domestic, international. Uh, however, there, there are systems in place already, and I'm sure uh, 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 Sumit will cover this uh, if he may, uh, wherein all compliances, whether they are compliances as far as manufacturing is concerned or statutory requirements, uh, because during our audits, uh, even the labor uh, is uh, audited, are those compliances in place or not? So thanks again to technology, all this automatically gets taken care of. Uh, I don't know, Sumit, if you'd like to add here. So yeah, I think uh, you, you, uh, it's, it's, it's a great point, Atul. And uh, with, the, with the diversity of workforce that exists in pharma, uh, as you mentioned, Ashutosh and Atul, uh, mm -hmm. the diversity is not just on the category of workforce, but also locational, regional, as, uh, I mean, and there are the, the, uh, the only way to manage it really well is through having the right technology interventions. Exactly. And, 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 and I think, uh, Atul, maybe uh, you alluded to it uh, from a compliance perspective. I think uh, uh, from a regulation perspective, I think pharma is one of the most regulated industries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so so, 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 so uh, unless we have, I mean, you have FDA compliance, social compliance, and then the local labor law compliances in each of the countries, unless there is enough uh, visibility to a leader like you, 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 uh, uh, for for your operations globally, uh, you are you are flying blind, right? So, 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 Ashutosh, to your point, yes, I mean, tech not only plays a role in uh, driving better flexibility and better availability, etc., but I think one of the critical aspects around managing workforce in tech is, of course, uh, uh, handling some of these very complex scenarios. Yes. So uh -huh. I'll just give you a little example and anecdote. Really, we were uh, evaluating a not evaluating. We had an LMS system in place and no names of companies here, yeah. uh, which worked very well for the domestic. But the minute I took it uh, to the international business unit, uh, which needed to be US FDA, they just said, "No, this cannot work. Uh, these reports will not be considered valid by the US FDA." And fuck, there went the project. So you, apart from knowing technology can help you, you must be aware of what all regulations and compliances need to be met. And does that technology actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, sink in with that? Uh, just a point really, Tashu. Ankush, Ankush, you've raised your hand. Yes, yeah. yes. so uh, thank you, uh, Ashu. Uh, just had a few uh, thoughts in sure. mind since we're talking about technology and IT and even Sumit also in a previous, uh, uh, talk he said uh, the importance of what IT uh, uh, scenario in pharma. So when I look at uh, IT perspective uh, or technology perspective uh, in pharma, so there are two aspects I consider I divide into two aspects. One is HR since we are all talking about manpower and HR. So when we talk about HR as, uh, as such, so uh, it starts from uh, basically a hiring process and during this pandemic, the technology we really uh, people could leverage that we could leverage that to such an extent where uh, most of the process from hiring itself was uh, uh, technology driven. That was one aspect. Then uh, complete employee life cycle uh, from uh, from hiring to uh, almost to end, including PMS, your 
uh, appraisals and uh, including your uh, PMS, it was handled through uh, IT. So this is HR part. Apart from that, uh, as a learning and development, uh, what Atul was saying that uh, uh, really it matters that how you adapt uh, to the best of uh, uh, possibilities in the regularity environment. Like you have a software which works for you, but uh, it may not uh, be applicable for your regularity environment. You may not have uh, the requisite uh, for, so you really have to eval evaluate whether uh, the software application, what you have really works both sides uh, as an employee friendly as well. And uh, it has to adapt to the uh, regularity side. It has to meet certain requirements, which is uh, required by different regulators in different countries. So this is as far as uh, HR side or I would say manpower side is concerned. Another side is uh, the technology on the floor, whether it is manufacturing, whether you are going in the field and interact with, interacting with various physicians how you really leverage the technology and pandemic has really shown that yes uh, you can really do it in far better way yeah uh, like uh, most of the time uh, during pandemic doctors were uh, not allowing to visit the medical reps so what to mm. do that was the challenge so uh, the companies have really gone to such a level that uh, this visit instead of visiting they were doing the calls on online so, and, and they really develop an application where uh, doctor was in constant touch with, with the medical rep. So uh, somewhere uh, this complete line was short circuited and uh, this was as good as you are going physically and visiting a doctor and appraising him about the product, what you are marketing. Another part is on the floor. Like uh, as uh, Namita was also saying, Anupam was also saying that on the floor, you have a certain set of technology and in pharma, you can, go to a certain level uh, as far as automation is concerned. But then uh, you have demand side and supply side both. So you have to manage. So in both the aspects, if you use the technology in the right way, it is really helping companies out. And you get different insights when you actually analyze uh, different inputs at different point of time, you get different insight and you, you, you are able to uh, take out the solutions for that. One of examples is the HR analytics. Mm -hmm. uh, we have used HR analytics to such an extent that uh, when you are appraising a person, his annual performance, you have all the data points in front of you as a manager, and you're talking on actuals and not on hypotheticals. This is the power of technology and power of IT uh, when we go into uh, HR and manpower uh, management. So, Ashu. Right. Uh, of course, uh, you know, there has been a lot of challenges uh, as we have adapted to the new normal and we have been discussing about that. Amitabha, I wanted to come to you and uh, sort of understand from you what are the new, uh, you know, training that the companies have uh, have started uh, considering that, of course, the pharma uh, sector itself is very complex. Uh, the the R&D uh, bit is there, then there's a doctor, then there is medical rep. And as everyone on the panel is talking about how the medical rep, the work, the, the way they have been working has completely changed, probably changed 360 degree after the pandemic had hit us. So how do you think the training has changed for all the employees? Uh, particularly in the pharma sector, and what has been the role of l in this? So two things. Uh, one is uh, how existing programs have changed in terms of the delivery. Yeah. And two, what new programs have come in or how new programs have been curated. Yeah. So the first thing that everybody has been talking about is how most of the training has moved to an online medium. And now, uh, you know, most employees, even at the shop floor, have options to do training on their smartphones and they don't even have to come to the classroom. So that's number one in terms of delivery. Okay. Two is the training content has got broken down into smaller modules, which was earlier not possible when you were calling people in physical presence. So today you can do module wise and you can also get certified on each module and you can get your certification online as you complete each module and it's very easy to track. So bringing it down to a module does two things. One is it increases the adaptability or understanding of the person to what the training is because they're short snippets of training. Mm -hmm. Two is it is very well customized to what the person is doing at that point in time. So it can be easily used rather than you take a lot of knowledge and you use it over a long period of time. 
when the effectiveness goes down, right? The second part is when we have moved so much into online, there is a huge focus on digital security. So uh, the entire uh, industry today is gearing more and more towards you know, security on the internet, security on the intranet, and how any information leakage needs to be controlled. Because when you are all working with physical paper pencil in classrooms and shop floor, you had control over what data was going out. Today, there is a huge restriction in terms of any computer, any smartphone that is used for official purposes to take out the data, print the data, send the data, or take attachments out. So data security has become paramount. Mm -hmm. The next thing which has started off is a lot of training on areas like POSH, areas like DEI, areas which are more related to code of conduct because as more and more employees start working in hybrid situations, that connect gets lost. So what was very normal when you were meeting people now needs to be reinforced because the same rules apply when you are on a Zoom call or when you are meeting somebody offline. The, the second part is on the sales rep, as one of my colleagues here mentioned, most of the sales reps have now gone into tools like tab, like different kinds of presentations which are very relevant, information which is real time and very customized for the KOLs or doctors that they meet. So you really don't depend so much on the memory of the, the person anymore. You don't actually depend on what data the person is actually showing because it's all updated, it's curated, it's actually available right at that point for the doctor or the KOL to see. So training for the, the field forces becomes so much online and so much real time. They don't have to come to a training center unless you want to do a team bonding exercise. So everybody has access to the latest data. They have access to the latest training uh, in terms of how to sell, how to convince, how each of the medicines are positioned versus the rest of that category worldwide, because that's a very important comparator basket that they need to always carry. So that's how I see uh, digital impact in training and L&D playing a huge role in terms of not just driving content, but also supporting other functions to drive their own training where content is driven by the functions. Okay. Farhat, you wanted to come in? You yeah, on. actually, it's a very important uh, subject uh, when we talk about the training or skills for the future requirement. You know, the pharma company has given a new paradigm in all the aspects of the business continuity. I will give example of the R&D, actually. It's a pharmaceutical science, actually. And I will give example of the product management team. The total definition of their profile is changed. The product management is something that they have to take the ownership also. When we talk, when we talk about the OTC segment also, it is governed by the government policies. Also, the marketing policies are changing. The OTC is taking a major portion also. The sales guys who are working on a root plan or beat plan now, they are becoming more key account kind of thing. They have more, they are more knowledgeable also. And one, one more factor which came into existence after this pandemic that uh, the trainings numbers are more and the people haven't, even I've seen the operators uh, uh, at shop floor and the break time or lunch time, they are completing their modules on their mobiles. So, so the learning uh, and future learning, the future skills are in, are really in demand. And uh, many many companies they have their more automation and designed uh, for to to upgrade their employees for the future skills. And one more thing, I would like to add that uh, the product ownership is also very very important for for all the employees, and that's why. Many companies, they are going for the competence foundation also. Even I will give the example of the person who are working in a supporting team like uh, accounts or HR, admin and all. But now companies providing the knowledge about the quality control also, what is operation, what is engineering, what is R&D, what is IPR, what is FND, what is ARD. So now, now the lot of skills are which, are which are not important for any employees of particular department. But now, because of the competence foundation, many companies are giving training air to all the employees. They should have a complete knowledge about the pharma. Uh, this is a big change which is happening. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, since this conversation around tech has been 
we've been talking so much and Amitabh, you raised this point also about we just what you were talking. What happens of the company culture? How do you drive it in an environment where tech is driving so much? What do the leaders then do? So, uh, do you want me to answer first? Yes, please. Yes, okay, please. And maybe, maybe others as well. Maybe others okay. as well. So, when I quickly, uh, yeah, sure. go ahead. Somebody else wants to take it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Amitabh, you can you can speak no problem. Okay. Amitabh, you Thanks can speak, and then and then we can uh, maybe okay. others okay. as well. So I'll take a minute on this because this sure. is a topic we can spend an hour on. Uh, <laughs> so I think I think culture. Uh, you you are right. The shift in how the culture needs to be maintained. Okay, and uh, there are two things that I see very prominent in the industry after or during and after the pandemic. One is the sheer amount of communication has gone up by leaps and bounds. Okay. And now there is a purpose to Gemba Walks. Uh, there are actually focused events to connect with small, medium, and large set of employees and actually talk about culture more than it was ever done before. Because earlier it was assumed that if you are coming to a workplace and you are meeting people, you mm -hmm. get ingrained into the culture. But today it is not assumed anymore. So there are actually programs on culture. There are surveys on culture. There are snippets on culture and there are regular communications on culture, which is being done just to reinforce that people are getting inducted the right way and they maintain that particular, uh, you know, the, that particular aspect. And the last and the most important thing is I'm seeing a lot of leaders carry culture in their goal sheets mm -hmm. as to how they're going to drive and manage it. Over to you, Farah. Farhat, you yeah, come in. Yeah. The culture is now very, very important after this pandemic when uh, when we need agility, when we need resilience also and all across. Uh, so many, many companies are coming out as the innovation in culture also. Uh, but the culture is not completed if the policies and the process and uh, they are not implemented properly. And because of the speed and the country business continuity, a lot of uh, issues are there. And we call this collaborative leadership, which is which is a part of culture now. And many companies are focusing on their the top leadership also because it cascades down the line when you are creating culture also. So culture is also now converted into a kind of a tool, uh, innovative culture, I would say, uh, which is mobilizing all across. It is not only the need. Uh, down the line, even that it starts from the top also. And many, many, I've seen that uh, many academics, uh, top class academics in India and abroad also, uh, they are focusing that how we can uh, bring a good culture in the organization, especially for the companies who are going for the next level and they are going to achieve the highest level of success. So culture is a very, very important phenomenon in now pharma. Okay, uh, Atul, Atul, you had raised your hand. Yeah, I did. Uh, not so much on culture, but to answer the first part of your question, you know, with so much of technology, what do leaders really do? Uh, I just want to tell you, there's a plethora of data, data analytics being thrown down to the field force, to everybody who wants it. So leaders have to step in here. And I'll just take you to a lovely line from the movie Top Gun. It's the pilot, not the plane. It's the man behind the machine. There's so much of technology. You know, Sumit and his folks are doing a great job. A lot of stuff coming in but you've got to direct the right thing at the right person mm. and not inundate them with so much of data that the man is fed up. He doesn't know what to do. So okay. as a leader, this is where you step in say, okay, my focus area now today is inventory. Let me see if I can correct inventory or how's the secondary moving stuff like mm. that. So the leader's role, otherwise the field force is going to say, Hey, there's too much coming my way. Forget it. I'm just going to do things the way I know it. So that's where leaders have to step in. Ank Ankush, you also want to step in on culture, it seems. You're on mute, Ankush. Yeah, okay. So uh, since we are talking about culture, uh, it is said generally that your, if your apps aspirations are global, then your practices cannot be local. And uh, that is the line which basically uh, mentions that uh, as we uh, grow uh, across the world, as the market expands, you really have to have one set of a culture, which is which is the standard one. You cannot have uh, uh, isolation in the industry itself. So ultimately, it converges to one best practices uh, kind of a thing, including the culture part. Uh, 
uh, if we have to say the best practices in terms of uh, your uh, people management best practices in terms of your uh, all the aspects of the industry whether how you manage people how you uh, schedule things how you uh, do uh, engage with people so all these aspect ultimately it converges at one point or another and, and that that's that's what i think is the differential uh, going forward just wanted to have that yeah sure. Ashwin. I think Anupam also raised his hand. Yeah, so I I want to add a dimension to the culture aspect, and I think it stems out from the nature of industry. Pharma industry typically is a very, very structured work environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it is highly regimented. Uh, the concept of quality is highly linked to compliance, and everything is SOP driven, right? So a lot of it is around practices which have to be followed in a particular way. And the culture is, uh, you know, something which, which is uh, linked to the nature of business. I think last two years have transformed the approach uh, dramatically. I mean, uh, leaders have realized that uh, in order to inspire people and to keep their team engaged, uh, right level of connect with compassion is very important. Mm -hmm. It cannot be an instruction-based relationship. Empathy and, uh, you know, in order to build up resilience in team, there has to be right level of engagement and right level of uh, messaging around uh, care and compassion. So I think uh, the culture is moving towards being more accommodative, more flexible, more inclusive in terms of, you know, people needs, their ideas, their views, and being a, being a business which is into life-saving drugs and manufacturing and supply of life-saving products, life of people in the organization matter. And, and this is where, you know, the messaging starts. So uh, the culture has moved more towards compassion, more towards uh, you know uh, leading, leading by example, and and values which are based on more humane understanding of business. Right, Sumit, so you uh, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I I think there are some great points here. I I wanted to make a connect to uh, to what Atul mentioned, which was around tech adoption to to culture, right? I mean, I know there are two. Uh, on the face of it, they might look at as as two di diametrically opposite things, but when the when the pandemic hit us, uh, uh, we we uh, all of us uh, and mainly uh, brick and mortar organizations had to adapt. Uh, overnight and uh, adapt and create a culture where you could adopt technology and start doing work around it right so 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 tech adoption also has a cultural element to it and and that that adaptation comes in three different forms for any, every organization either it can be deliberate it can be accidental or it can be forced right uh, the pandemic really forced uh, tech adoption of a certain nature that uh, I know of some company, one of my customers who said that when they deployed teams before the pandemic, I think the adoption rate was 1%. And within a month after the pandemic, the adoption rate was 96%, right? <laughs> I'm sure all of us have those stories. So forced, uh, it was a forced uh, adaptation uh, of, of technology, which drove a completely different culture for all of us. But I think as organizations, and this is going beyond the technology realm of what I do, but it applies to all of us, as, as organizations, I think we need to be constantly on the lookout for deliberate adaptation. And I think this was mentioned right in the beginning by, by a panelist. I forget who said that, but it was mentioned right in the beginning that how do you deliberately look at bringing that change? Yeah, that's Atul mentioned. Yes. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the critical path. And, and, and associated to that, uh, technology goes hand in hand. You've got to drive that change. Uh, you will run into issues. I mean, as Atul mentioned, Organizations many times are guilty, by the way, and I'm being a tech person, I can, I can say, I can still say this happens. Organizations many times are guilty of adopting too much tech at the same time and throwing too much tech to the employee at the same time. Okay. Never do that because that's where people don't know what's hit them. You've got to have KPI, small critical success factors, start pushing that and one by one, keep on doing it. And, and it really delivers a lot of results. 
but those are some thoughts on tech versus culture but triathlon yeah can i just uh, step in for just 10 seconds yeah, i'm sure. a gr- great guy for you know four p's and five a's so i have these three a's uh, really uh, <laughs> yeah. to, uh, as far as uh, technology is concerned and the first is you uh, uh, adopt a technology what people are talking about and then you adapt so that's where change comes in you adapt to the technology but the real test lies in the third a that i talk of which is absorption of the technology the technology has to get thoroughly absorbed in the entire length and breadth of the company that's when you will find it and it can be done with the focus of senior leaders like i said in my previous articulation so these are the three a's of technology that i have for you sumit i I'm, i'm 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 stealing it atul <laughs> and and i notice there are five a's on the screen today yeah five top class whose names begin with a <laughs> yeah starting with you ashu <laughs> well all of us all of us right so just eye on the clock we just have less than 30 minutes before we wrap up the session uh, uh let's take some questions uh, from our audience and a uh, couple of them actually piled on as we had we were very deep dived uh, deep diving into the conversation so let me take the first question from uh, angelo dais i hope i pronounce the name correctly so the question is i think uh, it's uh, anybody can take that question it's open to anybody uh, the what percentage of the employees do you think would be aware of the benefits being provided to them by the employer how do you promote mental well-being in your organization who would like to take so uh, two parts yeah. to it okay fine farath we let you go otherwise the man will not be kind to us <laughs> so <laughs> <would you? laughs> nah, as you were talking about the technology change before giving this uh, question answer i would like to speak one sentence that caterpillar should should not be converted into butterflies but it should be speedy caterpillar technology <laughs> does not mean that okay okay as for the policies are concerned i think many good organizations they have a very robust uh, hrms also hcm also and uh, now things are uh, one login app application is also there that employees just log in once and they can go to any and any other intervention the process the company's policies and all it is av- available on the finger tip so okay so the speed is there the technology is there i think uh, promoting uh, interventions and policies is not a great concern for, uh, nowadays in any any pharma good pharma companies okay. actually you would like to take the next question i thought atul wanted to answer that uh, oh, okay. okay you're deaf okay let's move on to the next question then and this one comes from jagmohan rishi and what he's written in the q and a tab so uh, how can leaders help in adoption in the way the current change is happening so maybe sumit quick uh, answer to that and uh, maybe anupam you would also like to uh, put in your views here yeah so uh, i think uh, so a- a- adoption of any technology has uh, a- a, i mean a variety of factors we we addressed uh, some of that just a few minutes back in terms of what you're giving to the employee but 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 end of day uh, what's in it for him really in my mind makes a lot of difference and 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 if i were to for a moment because we've done a lot of technology for our white collar employees in general so i think there is a lot out there literature if you will out there in terms of how you can get them to adopt but let's move for a moment to say a blue collar or contract employee what kind of technology can you give him or her and what kind of information does he or she need which you can make available at fingertips which makes their life easier otherwise in a in a unionized environment one common challenge or concern tends to be that the moment i have technology thrown at that employee maybe this is for some kind of policy this is for some kind of uh, 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 exploitation so 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 adoption one of the biggest reasons why adoptions happens is if you are able to communicate what's in it for me pretty well right uh, of course then there are a lot of other mechanisms from a technology standpoint that i've seen companies use i have a customer which has about 35 plants across the country and uh, one of the things that the hr head does is uh, some kind of a gamification uh, a chart across all the plants saying across these 15 parameters who's doing what very simple uh, thing i mean there's no no uh, negative uh, uh, co- uh, incentivization it's all positive reinforcement but it automatically starts building a certain amount of uh, a fun gamification that i've got to be at 99% when that other guy is at 99% mm. and it drives adoption up dramatically so so that's that's yeah. at a, that's from a corporate level what you can do but at an employee I, level you've got to tell him what's in it for him atul yeah over 
Yeah, so uh, let me give you the answer. Maybe the person who asked the question is since uh, he may be the same guy. I think he is Jagmohan Rishi. He's the author of a book. Uh, I think the book is called Are You a Digital Dinosaur? So the answer to his question is all leaders should read that book. They will know how to <laughs> adopt to technological okay. changes. Okay. That's a quick plug. Yeah. Anupam, Anupam, just a quick answer to the question uh, from uh, how can leaders help in adoption in the current way changes are happening? Right. So I think, uh, you know, Sumit has covered a very important point. Uh, I would reinforce that it is very important that the need for, you know, having a technology is positioned rightly. And as they say, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of all adoption. We adopted a lot of technology over the last two years, which was, which was all because that was the only way to uh, move forward. Uh, I think it's a part of change management process and organization should, should have a design around it. It should not be just dumped on people or system. Uh, it should go through a process. It cannot be a buy and impose kind of approach. So, you know, participation is, is the right approach and right way forward in that. Okay, so uh, let me go to the next question. Uh, this is from uh, Ashim uh, Kosh. And he writes uh, that we are all aware that digital transformation has become number one strategic imperative for many organizations. But the question is uh, what companies are doing or should do to ensure better ROI on this digital expenses. So uh, maybe I can uh, throw this question to Farad. Yeah, it's a very valid question in today's, it looks very simple, the digital world or transformation, but it costs money actually. And and that the organization, if they have a very strong pipeline of the products and they have a very strong uh, uh, vision to achieve something in the next five or 10 years, uh, they are the players, uh, they, are, they are ready to adopt this kind of technology. Otherwise, it's a huge gap between the ROI and all. Okay, this is this is very important for the organization while choosing the technology. Uh, it should be aligned with the company culture, objectives, and the vision also. And uh, my experience says that in the last three years that many companies are spreading their tentacles and going into the different areas also. Uh, I've seen my companies are going for digital kind of uh, laboratory products and all. They are where they, are, they see the opportunity because uh, they cannot ignore the uh, digital transformation or technology advancement also. At the same time, they should create a very strong uh, vision also with respect to the business continuity. Right. It's a very yes. important question. Ankush, uh, I think, has raised his hand. Sure. Yes. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Farad has rightly said, that uh, uh, before you go into, because uh, it happens quite a lot that uh, since there is a digital revolution and everybody is talking about digitalization and technology, you just cannot uh, uh, jump the bandwagon and just say that, okay, I'll adapt this. But first you have to see whether there is a need first of all and how it is going to add the value. So due diligence before you implement a technology, I think that is this is a precursor for making the technology successful in your organization. And it does happen in a lot of organizations that you adopt a technology and you expect ROI from first month itself. It requires incubation, incubation time for technology to be successful. So it, it needs uh, uh, proper planning and then it needs, you have to consider the incubation time for giving mm -hmm. the real ROI. So this is just for, uh, just wanted to add to what Farad has said. So this is this sure. question has to be observed. Yeah, Nasreen. Okay. Okay, so the next question comes from Chinmaya Mohanty and uh, the question here is what it says. Has the great resignation impacted the pharmaceutical sector post pandemic? Uh, and he's, he wants this question to be specifically answered by Atul Suri. So Atul, that one goes yeah. to you. So I have a, a, a different thought really, you know, everyone's talking of the great resignation. I want to uh, you know, offer a different perspective to this. It's not the great resignation that's happened. It's actually the great breakout. For two <laughs> years, there were no opportunities. There was no lateral, there was no uh, movement happening at all. And now that things have opened up, companies are hiring again. Uh, companies are willing to, you know, take fresh talent on board. So the vacancies are there and therefore it is the great breakout. But to answer uh, his uh, basic question, really, how did pharma companies uh, handle it during the pandemic? Well, uh, to answer that question very specifically, 
uh, for the field force only. I'm not talking of the manufacturing and stuff like that because I think his question is more towards the field force. There were there was considerable movement even during the pandemic. Uh, while attrition rates in the industry for the field force would range anything between 15 to 25 percent, depending on which company you are in. Uh, I don't think there was so much of a delta. At best, there would have been a delta of about five points downwards in terms of attrition. There was physical movement happening. People were getting hired across the board. Uh, and uh, we also onboarded a lot of uh, freshers uh, during this particular period. So yes, great resignation is OK. Uh, the numbers have increased. But it's essentially because everybody was bottled up and things have opened now. But I see things now stabilizing. The vacancies of the field force uh, across companies, and I speak to a lot of friends uh, in similar companies, uh, the vacancies now are not as drastic as it was immediately once we had opened up. Right. Uh, Amitabh, if I can come to you, uh, what kind of digital uh, interventions, uh, if I can ask, uh, should manufacturers you know, undertake to manage the growing complexity of workforce? We have ma we have spoken about uh, full time contract, gig workers, hybrid, and these are reality and these are going to stay. I mean, these this are the category of workers which are going to stay. So, Amitava, how do you think digital interventions can help? So, uh, two things. First, uh, you mentioned a lot of workforce category. Um, and of course, uh, that list is expandable uh, because we have apprentices, we have uh, various different kinds of consultants and so on and so forth. Uh, so the first thing I, I, I see people doing or companies moving to is an online workforce management tool. That's something that we used to use in uh, you know, the tech industry, primarily in companies which were uh, you know, supporting various uh, you know, IT BPOs and so on and so forth. Uh, but now that WFM tool is very, very prominent in the industry. So that's number one. Number two, I spoke earlier about uh, basic automation in the plant itself. So that means two things. One, you have lesser number of people on the floor at any point in time. Two is there is a, a, a huge dearth of paperwork, which actually happens. So most of the stuff is automated. So the, the chance of somebody making a mistake or the chance of somebody recording a wrong number is very, very less. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this monitoring can be done remotely. So a supervisor who was earlier monitoring, let's say one part of the process can now monitor half a floor because it's all available on various screens. The third part which is coming in is uh, you know, automation in the way people are training and learning, which we also spoke a lot about. So that is helping people to learn in modules, cohorts, and then become more proficient in the job that they are doing. And it's also helping us create a sort of a bench, which earlier was never possible in a manufacturing industry. Because of today, fungible training programs, you can actually train people on multi-skills uh, while they are working on one part of the company. And today, a lot of progressive companies are coming up with career paths which are digitally advertised through your internal job postings. So actually an employee knows where he or she can go and what are the skills required to move into that role and what kind of experience is there. So, you know, the whole picture, if you look at it, it has training, it has got workforce management, it has got various amount of career pathing and options available to an employee. So in totality, the employee and the employer both can monitor things much more real time. Mm -hmm. And they really don't need too many people telling them various different interpretations or various different ways of you know, telling the story, which today has become a uniform concept. And mm -hmm. most importantly, you can get all of it on your smartphone. It has some other issues, which are on tech security and all that, which we spoke about earlier. But overall, I see this as a huge change, which is taking us into the next uh, you know, decade or so. Awesome. Uh, this is an awesome point that you make, Amitav, because uh, the largest, while you spoke of fungibility of some of those training programs and teams, how do we ultimately, and that is also something that companies would like to think about, how can companies make the organization more radically adaptable so that the impact can be felt across the board. Atul, would you like to talk a little bit about that? 
Yes, I did uh, uh, right at the beginning. And uh, I think, yeah, so uh, uh, this is the need of the hour for especially the senior management radical adaptability. Uh, I think there's a, a person who just written a book, I'm yet to read it. Uh, and that book is uh, Competing in the New World of Work uh, by Keith uh, Ferrazzi. Uh, I did read a book review on LinkedIn on this, uh, and I quite agree with all the thoughts there. Uh, we have to be totally radically adaptable as an organization. We have to be forward looking. There has to be resilience. There has to be foresight. Uh, now, all these are not just fancy buzzwords. We as uh, senior uh, people in organizations need to sit down and see how adaptable we can get and have our plans in place. I'd spoken about this a little earlier and uh, pretty much those are my thoughts around uh, uh, radical adaptability. Sure. Nasreen, uh, would you like to maybe ask the next question? Put yeah. Up. Sorry, I just uh, lot, lost uh, connection. That's why I couldn't hear uh, ah, what oh. Atul was uh, saying. And uh, my, actually, my next question was uh, to uh, Farad. And uh, this is about the HR and uh, you know operation function. And uh, basically, I wanted to know how HR and operation functions come together to re-architect the work and the workforce and the workplace to win in the industry 4.0 as uh, the, 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 that's the flavor of the, the season post pandemic. Yeah, it is always a challenge for any organization to have a collaborative uh, uh, relationship and uh, the functions and the interventions are aligned. Yeah. When we talk about the employee value proposition or employee experience and especially the companies who are having a very mixed complex more, more business model, module like pharma, it is always a great concern uh, for the HR to align the quality with the operation and the supporting department. Uh, all these things are a challenge for the HR. But the good companies, they have a good system and process and the PMS and play a very important role when the goals are aligned and uh, you have a routine uh, review also and you have a routine meeting also collaborative with the, the strong, robust uh, process and system and the leaders are attending and, and, and digital transformation has given a good uh, opportunity also to connect easily also. The employees are connected uh, fast and easily also and this this issue is over in pharma companies when we, we talk about the alignment of different departments and they are working together i think this pandemic has given a new dimensions to for to many companies especially pharma to work together i think this is a this although it was a challenge but now it is converted into opportunity yeah. that is a that is a great a, example of nature that when you have more challenges it means that you have more opportunities very interesting point uh, very interesting point uh, that you mentioned Farad there because uh, you know something like that uh, that's also the opportunity the way manufacturing is evolving uh, you know manufacturing industry 4.0 that we spoke about just now and manufacturing in the road ahead anupam with your experience in the industry almost three decade industry how would you say what is the data driven manufacturing specific to the pharmaceutical industry how could that change the face of the industry in the years ahead? Okay, I think I'll, I'll try and be as short as possible at the same time, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. uh, as, I, as I said, and as uh, you know, other panelists also emphasized uh, that pharma industry is a highly regulated industry and uh, depending on what kind of business model you have, the complexity around those regulations uh, you know, increase or become more and more critical. So one of the major challenge which all of us face and HR, uh, you know, HR related challenges that uh, human errors are the cause of maximum deviations or, you know, uh, whenever there is a deviation or a problem, most of the root cause analysis leads to human error uh, resulting into next level of training, you know, we have something called CAPA, which is corrective action and remediation plan and whatever. I think uh, automation and uh, digitalization is going to play a very important role. Uh, gone are the days when, uh, you know, uh, people would uh, manually do the packing activity. Most of the packing activity is now automated uh, with robotics. 
to an extent that a packing belt, which would have something like eight to 10 of the packers uh, 15 years back uh, would, would now have only one. And then there is a lot of uh, automation in terms of uh, implementation of SCADA, implementation of uh, you know, limbs in labs. So these are, these are uh, specific technologies uh, you know, related to pharma industry. So most of the aspects of operations are now getting automated. Uh, and if I were to define the level of automation, it is more in terms of uh, automating the machines and processes. I think uh, there's a big gap in integrating all this automation, all these automations and, uh, you know, using the data and, and, and the digital information which these machines create uh, with the labor productivity and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, employee KPIs. So that is where the industry has to move towards and, and move forward to, uh, you know, in terms of technology, there is technology available for automation of operations and that is happening. Sure. Right, right. So one last, uh, you know, one question I want to open, uh, you know, it is open to the floor. Uh, this is because we have talk, uh, spoken about technology, uh, you know, a lot of time and we are talking about the workforce management. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, you know, ask everybody in this panel is the expansion of technology has been one common denominator and we've all agreed to that and uh, especially in the pharma sector, but how has it altered the numerator, the workers, the process and the ultimately the outcome? Have you, have you seen, of course, there, are, there, is, there is an visible outcome, but how can you accelerate that? Who wants to take it first? It's an open question. Actually, I would, uh, would like to take the example of Peter Ducker that he already predicted that uh, one day the e-commerce and technology will be there all across in the world. But no one can deny the, the, the human connection also, you know. And sure. especially, especially in this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, this emotional intelligence and the resilience and the gratitude, these things are the part of now leadership, top leadership. They started understanding to have more connection with the employees. <clears throat> and it has been seen that, that it has really helped the organization to achieve the target, also the productivity and the retention is also improved. Uh, so as I was telling that this, this, this is not the problem. A disruption has given a new opportunities yeah. to not only the organization, I've seen the many leaders also, they have shifted their paradigm that they are more effective also. Okay, I think just about time to, Sumit, one quick uh, question to a point that we all have heard, data is the new oil. I heard a different version of that. Data is the new soil on which everything grows. <laughs> 2030, what's your prediction? How do you see the things changing? Yeah, I, I, uh, no, no, no doubt data is new oil, soil, but what uh, I think soil is better because what you make of that soil really matters. Uh, otherwise, you can just be inundated with soil and uh, really get nothing out of it, right? So, so I think I like the soil thing uh, nice. Uh, so, so it's all going to be data. It's all uh, 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 fact-based decision-making, uh, data-based decision-making in just about every single field uh, is going to be the norm. It was already happening. It's the pandemic just hastened everything uh by 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 maybe a decade i don't know i mean there was there was this saying in the early days of pandemic i read this somewhere it's attributed to i think lenin or whoever doesn't matter but there are there are decades when nothing happens and then there are weeks when decades happen right so so that's what happened during the pandemic Absolutely. as far as tech, tech adoption is concerned and uh, and and this uh, it's it, this is this is going to be there uh, across the board, I think each one of the panelists have talked about the kind of technology that is being adopted across every single piece. I feel because I come from the workforce technology side of the world, and I think Anupam kind of highlighted that I feel that the pace at which workforce technology is generally adopted is generally tends to be slower than the rest of the piece that's been traditionally the norm. Uh, there is a pace right now better than earlier, but it, it, in my mind, it still lags and I think organizations need to really look at how they can derive the best out of their workforce, because that's the real asset eventually and where tech can play a role. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. We've completely run out of time. Uh, well, as uh, I keep hearing again from the industry that you can 
manage some of the assets that you have, the, the technology, you can manage that, but ultimately it's the people who make the difference. And whatever makes different makes a difference to the way people can work, uh, that will be, the, or that will help be the winner. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Nasreen, thanks so much for uh, helping me out with all of this. We had a lovely conversation and uh, um, def definitely a very, very insightful uh, conversation and, uh, and and a peek to the to, to a sector which definitely really, really took us out and helped us correct. to uh, the biggest challenge in the pandemic. And without the pharma sector, I don't think we would have been able to meet the challenge. And of course, the vaccine, there is so much a different conversation about the vaccine altogether. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for Thank being you. with us Thank for this wonderful you. conversation. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Teeny Team.